Okay, now as you will tell from the schedule, because you've all got one, you've been looking at it, we've now got a panel session. So we've entitled this panel, Do We Have a Secure Southwest? And basically this reflects the fact we've now been doing this event for a few years. I think we started back in 2012. And so this, as you can tell from the name of it, is the ninth time we've done it. Um, and it's one of several initiatives that we've, we run and that are run in the Southwest region to help promote cybersecurity awareness and skills. Now, other things that we've got within the region, we've got the Southwest Cyber Cluster, the Southwest branch of the IISP, the Southwest Warp, um, other events such as CyberCon, various companies offering cyber-related services, and also security-related degrees and apprenticeships at our regional universities. So with all this expertise and all this support available to them, our organisations in the Southwest actually feeling more secure and more protected is the question we're sort of trying to ask here. Are they sufficiently aware of the security issues, and do they feel they have access to the necessary skills and support? So, I don't have an answer to this, but luckily I've got a group of people here that hopefully do. Um, so to explore the issues with us and with yourselves um, on the panel, we have, um, in the order I've got them alphabetically on my bit of paper, not necessarily the order they've sat, we've got Michael Deeroff, Managing Director of Blue Screen IT, which is a Plymouth-based provider of security services, solutions and training. And Michael's also currently working with the Digital Policy Alliance, leading a cybersecurity skills pilot for Plymouth. We have Peter Jones, an experienced information security and data forensic professional, and a senior cybersecurity consultant with Securius, one of our sponsors, an Exeter based cybersecurity compliance company. Uh, Peter is also a co founder of the Southwest Cybersecurity Cluster. And lastly, we have Dr. Maria Papabaki, an associate professor of cybersecurity here at the University of Plymouth, and also program manager for our bachelor's and master's degrees in computer and information security. So collectively amongst them, my hope is that they know something about the questions that I'll ask and hopefully that you'll ask as well. And yes, then we have you, um, the audience. So you're a group of potentially uh, interested parties in terms of whether we've got a secure Southwest. Um, you might be looking for security support here within the region. So hopefully the theme of the panel is one that uh, you might have an opinion on or at least some questions to ask of them. Okay, so without further ado, I'll set things going so that you know how a question can be asked of them and you see how they respond and that they're not too frightening and things of that nature. And then really I'm going to try and throw it over to you so I just stand here and listen for the rest of the session, okay? Is that a deal? All yeah. right, a few of you have said yes, and I know Bob will ask questions, so that's good. So, panel, in your experience, how well positioned do you think companies and other organizations in the Southwest actually are in relation to cyber security? And we'll go in the order of, because nobody's immediately put their hand up, we'll ask Peter, because he's furthest away from me and can't hit me for picking on him. Yeah, that's all right. Um, the interesting thing that's happening with the South West is we've got some fantastic companies that have sprouted up, some of startup companies, um, and <coughs> because they tend to be part of the bigger supply chain and there's been more emphasis from the government about supply chain and being able to demonstrate your cyber health, your security awareness, there, there's been a better push. Uh, and what, we see, what is particularly good is actually trying to seek that help more locally as opposed to automatically associating security to London. So that's the biggest thing I've seen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Michael, we're looking eager. Hi, yeah, thank you, and, and thanks for that. Um, yeah, it, I completely agree. You know, there's definitely that kind of a common drive, and um, having experienced things sort of national, international levels, and working with companies in different areas, countries, etc., we quite clearly say it's no different. We're not in any better or worse position down in the southwest. Um, we're all fighting the fight, or as I mentioned to someone earlier, perhaps some people don't realise there is one to fight. But um, in general, you know, not with any particular quantifiable statistic as such in a, in a research report, um, we find the market very similar. We don't see any higher risk or lower risk as, uh, as far as it goes. Thank you. Maria, any comments? Um, yeah, so um, looking at, uh, I, I will agree with um, uh, both um, uh, my colleagues here. So uh, 
I don't think it is particularly different to um, the other uh, areas um, nationally. Um, but what we have seen um, in the past, um, especially year, is that the attitudes towards security have changed. So perhaps awareness towards the need um, to improve their security posture um, has improved, um, and perhaps the high-profile cases um, that have taken place recently uh, with malware, ransomware and so on have perhaps helped to raise that awareness. Great, thank you. So, that's some initial comments from the panel on an initial question. Does that prompt any thoughts from the audience or indeed have you got questions you'd already like to ask? Ah, we have a hand back there. The microphone will come to you. There we go. Mine isn't really about the southwest, really, but I want to know, um, as a security professional, what's the difference between security and cybersecurity? Because to me, it's a buzzword. We're scaremongering the population, and you're talking about cyber health check or cyber awareness. But back in the day, it used to be security health check and security awareness. So nobody can seem to answer my question, and I keep asking it for everybody. So I was just wondering if the panel are able to answer it. A buzzword? Oh. How could you, madam? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, panel, what do we reckon? Yeah, I'd like to, actually. Um, so the approach from security perspective, um, let's say something like um, into, uh, uh, data protection, which is a big thing at the moment and the way it's going, and to understand that data protection is not just about your electronic or logical data, it's about where the physical things reside too. So really looking at security from a holistic perspective, information security is about the pr preservation of your information and securing its integrity and confidentiality, etc. Um, cyber security, I kind of do see there is a slight buzzword to that, with, without a doubt, and it's becoming like a marketable buzzword, even so much so that you can see the change in marketing materials for cyber or security companies now starting to refer more to cyber. The reality says that it has to be holistic. You invent, or, or sorry, invent, invest into all the controls that you like, all the firewalls, all the rest of it. If your physical controls aren't correct or in place, then it's pointless. So, um, yeah, there, there definitely has to be more of a distinction that identifies it as information security, but there is a market separation right now, calling it cyber, a lot of focus on cyber, a lot of focus on technical controls, but this morning we've heard discussions about how important the human element is. Yeah, you're right, and it kind of is because you could say IT security and cyber security are synonymous with each other, whereas security could refer to a multitude of things, and information security, again, perhaps a wider umbrella. Any other panellists with a view? Peter? Yeah, it's, uh, maybe we could giggle this one because it depends on how much outside you're looking in. I know through various practices of through educational, because uh, I teach, I don't just do this work. There's so, uh, certain words you can't go away from, however much you've tried. Digital security, information security, the word security. And it all depends what hat I've got on. When I'm doing auditing, it's information assurance. Sometimes you can't avoid it. Uh, I found with some of the work I've done, the wording is dictated to me by a governing body. Or oh, it's come from an ISO standard that says, you know, we'll, from here from in, we'll refer to data security as whatever. Um, scaring people, uh, I think the media does that on their own. I don't think we help with that. <laughs> they can do that. Um, and media's got a lot to say. You know, cyber sounds far more scarier than digital. Uh, well, the fact is it's just ones and zeros. And the thing you print out, the piece of paper, that has got just as much of importance as a computer. So it depends on what compliance channel you're going down. So unfortunately the term cyber health, the reason that people use the word health is actually get people to realise that actually the human factor and the computer factors should be coincide with each other. You should actually, pardon the expression, but give a monkeys about your computer health. You should understand about keeping that computer up to date, keep it healthy, keep it running clean, keep it running lean. So unfortunately that's where some of these um, ambiguous terms come from. Uh, and yeah, even in this industry, we could giggle internally and say, we'd love not to use them. The reality is, we get told to use them to a certain degree. 
So I'll ask Maria because you're an associate professor of cyber security <laughs> and my academic title is about information security so I feel sort of behind the curve and a bit dated. So is there any difference? Uh, do you want the honest answer? Yes. Of course. Um, yes. So um, is there isn't behind the curve? <laughs> Probably. So, um, I will agree in the sense that, um, yes, yeah, cyber is a term that we now understand, or most people understand, uh, relating to computer information security. In reality, if you look at the definitions, there isn't really a difference. Um, but I would say it's also how people perceive it. And so um, different people will have heard about cyber security. A fewer set of people will have heard about computer information security, for example. Um, so, yes, in reality, there isn't really a difference. Um, but, yes, it could be used as a buzzword. It could be used as something that more people will probably have heard of and will be able to associate um, our domain um, with yeah, computer and information security, basically. I'm going to have my two penneth in here as well. I mean, basically, if you look, you can find definitions that will try to present cyber security as something distinct from information security, computer security, but that really isn't the way that the, the term is being used out there in the sector. I think it is, as the, the panelists have generally said, being used as a synonym. So you can make it different, but in most cases, people aren't. And I think the, the main reality is it's the term that feels current, it's the term that the media like, it's the term that government like, and it attracts a nice bit of attention. Um, it sounds more current um, than information security perhaps does these days. Further questions? Because, ah, look at that, Shannon. You've got some running to do now. Who do you choose? The closest. The closest. <laughs> um, we see nowadays that small businesses and medium-sized businesses are using more technology, but they don't have the financial backing to safeguard themselves from attacks like the big corporations would do. How would they go about protecting themselves, or should we trust less information with such a businesses? Anyone want to jump in? Oh, works again. Okay. Um, it's quite difficult, to be honest. It's, I think one of the presenters earlier alluded to the lack of budget. And unfortunately, media also has a part to play on how they convey what's the most important part of security risks. Usually when we get involved with businesses, it's due to some sort of compliance trigger or, or unfortunately, the reactive, it's already gone wrong trigger. Um, and it's a case of businesses just like to go for the quick fix, try and get things in quickly to fix a problem. Reality is, though, we've taken businesses on a journey, understanding their... <laughs> I've used the term cyber health, and I'm only using that this afternoon because it's been planted in my head. Um, looking at comp companies and how they can gradually grow to be more cyber compliant, more organically w grow to the point where they can financially afford to be more secure. Uh, I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of vendors out there that says, buy our solution, our solution will fix everything. Ooh, shiny magpie effect. Reality of that, actually, maybe it's just a case of using a better antivirus, configuring a firewall quicker. And it's getting those ethical co companies to come in and finding out where realistically you stand as a business and actually putting the, a solution that actually meets the business's need but then grow their needs, grow their standard. Um, particularly, I would say, you know, get to that bronze standard, get to that first pedestal, get in some decent antivirus in place, get some proper configuration in place, get even getting down to having some patching in place. And when you grow as a business and you get more machines, and you get more servers, that's where you can start investing in the bigger products, like your logarithms of this world. But two-man bands, four-man bands, so forth, it's just about getting there, what they've got already working efficiently in a lean. I think one of the areas we experienced is the definition of SME, I guess, and saying that um, it really doesn't always come down to business size in people. It always comes down to due care, what you need to look after and how much care you need to take. So with, with uh, you know, past experiences um, looking after, say, a one-man band, but happened to be a commodities trader who traded with some countries where commodities, we all understand, would have a higher risk, um, going through to large organizations which might not have any of that risk because they just deal with public media data. 
to something that's already in the public domain and they don't have the risk of the loss. So classifying as a small business solution doesn't always come into the bracket. It's about having that business understand what due care they should take with the type of data and the operations that they actually, I guess, um, uh, work with. Um, so SME-wise, um, as, as Peter mentioned, there are lo lots of quick wins, you know, things like patching and, and, and perimeter security, things like that, set you to a point where we're beyond, um, let's say if we put it to the physical realm of the traditional opportunist thief walking down the road looking for the house with the weakest locks, you start to avoid these issues and you start to, I guess, become less of a target and perhaps you could say someone with more depth and more persistent skills, but the likelihood is a lot lower. So. Um, as far as the SME mechanism goes, it should always come down to due care, the type of data you have, and then you have to appropriately, um, I guess, protect that. And, and, and another thing that Peter mentioned is looking down the compliance route, because sometimes you have to. You don't have a choice. It's based on your contract. It's based on a standard that you wish to achieve or legislation. Um, and just to to and just to. It keeps um, turning on. Thank you. Um, and to add to um, um, my colleagues, to what they said, um, I think there is a change in the sense that, um, yes, as a first step, you need to look at, or perhaps organizations need to be given more help um, to defend against the standard automated attacks that they are looking for um, the low hanging fruit basically, um, the insecure organizations that are not doing vulnerability scanning, that they are not patching their systems, um, <coughs> they might have weak web applications, um, and then look into building uh, up and improving their security posture to look for um, data security and to look for information leakage and to um, yeah, to have more controls, uh, look at human aspects of security, and so on. Um, but, and perhaps for the the first step, um, more could be done to automate this process uh, to make sure that a lot more organisations sort of tick this box um, quickly and easily, um, and then they can concentrate their resources, uh, their limited resources, admittedly, to um, further um, areas. So, Omar, did that answer your question? Because I think that question is one that you and various of your colleagues on SEC 101 would have liked an answer to for your assignment work, yeah? Because that was a very, very good way of getting some information. Well done. Uh, there were further hands up, I noticed. All right, one over there and one over there, Shannon. Um, referring to what Maria said earlier about awareness, uh, with all the initiatives and sort of regional courses, uh, would you say that the Southwest is perhaps uh, maybe ahead of the rest of the nation in terms of awareness about cyber and information security, not, ma not in terms of actual like progression, in terms of mainly just awareness? And would you say um, this has perhaps come across um, because maybe the Southwest beforehand were a bit behind, maybe due to the largely uh, aging, rural and sort of inherently uh, less tech-savvy uh, demographic? Um, well, let's not forget that parts of Southwest <laughs> Uh, very secure. <laughs> um, so there is no evidence to suggest that the Southwest differs from the rest of the country in that respect. So just looking at the economy and the type of businesses that operate in this area, I would say that um, the security stamp will fit their profile for the type of industry. So we see a lot of SMEs. Um, and yes, there are some security companies, there is some manufacturing as well, um, uh, so for military contracts. Um, and so in some areas, security would be a lot more robust. In others, uh, especially for SMEs, um, they will be facing the same problems that other organizations face nationally. Any other thoughts from the panel? It's quite an interesting one, actually, because I think I can speak a bit more nationally, because as you can tell from the accent, I'm not local. I, I came to Plymouth University for my first degree, and I left the region because of how backwards the region was. And I graduated in 2004, so that's quite a long, long time ago now. I've done two degrees elsewhere since then. 
However, it depends on what's driving the security um, levels at the time. So a lot of work, I did quite a bit of work in the Northwest cluster before the Southwest cluster existed. And they did a lot of work around nuclear. Uh, quite a very interesting work at the SCADA stuff this morning. And there's certain drivers, but this, and this was before we had some of the compliance stuff that's out now. And it was understanding how, how do we protect these systems. And a lot of it was guessing games. And I suppose it's the same thing down here. It depends on what, where the industry is, what's particularly more prominent. So down in Plymouth, particularly, we have the maritime uh, industry. And that's improved tenfold when it comes to cybersecurity stuff and information security. But the difference is the rest of the UK knows about it now. And I think that's the biggest difference. When I disappeared back, um, back to Yorkshire, I didn't know what was going on in the southwest. I didn't know what was going on in the southwest, but maybe probably in the past four or five years. I wouldn't say the word boomed. I would say the word is it's come up to the level of the rest of the country. So the same things that are plaguing my fellow Yorkshiremen are plaguing the Cornish and the Devonshire folk. There was another hand, and I think it was Bob's. Thank you. Yep, you're on. Uh, an open question to the panel, really, is concerning the introductory chairman's question to you, which was, is the Southwest secure? Perhaps I'll put as a point of discussion some metrics that need to be considered in measuring whether the Southwest, Southwest is secure. How many organizations have been hacked? And what type of viruses or hack was prevalent? What did they do about it? How many employed people are in the Southwest in cybersecurity? And how many organizations are working with the ITUT on blockchains? Uh, because this is the next generation of internet security uh, promulgation. So, those questions, please. Brief question for you to answer there. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, Text. we're going to try to get his mic yeah, to work. There we go. Um, so let's let's go to the, the root of the, the the start of the questions. In that, um, I mean, they're getting hacked. What are they getting hacked with? What's kind of prevalent at the moment? And I, I think um, two of the things we're seeing a lot at the moment is uh, more and more social engineering getting used to craft into phishing uh, but a much larger and more um, planned scale so adept teams I wouldn't call them particularly you know advanced hackers or anything just reusing tools bought off the dark net or something like that um, the fact that uh, things like ransomware dashboards can be purchased and then you can then as they quite uh, to deeply term it, you can then uh, manage your clients more effectively from this dashboard. Um, I think, um, yeah, so ransomware is one big one. They're still floating about in various guises. CEO fraud on the basis of a uh, much more crafted social engineer that is about now that looks into profiles online, open source intelligence, links the two together, understands scheduling and then preys on the fact that somebody, and this is a very recent attack that we've dealt with, where £75,000 left the organisation um, on the basis that they were new and then that would push to the process in the business that said somebody new was allowed to kick out two payments above £30,000. So um, that's probably one of the biggest things we see and the impact being the highest. Um, ransomware a little bit less so in terms of impact because the reality is most of the ways to reverse that sit on the dark net. So if you know where to look, you can typically decrypt your problem fairly rapidly. Um, it's just a situation of it is prevalent and it's the impact of the loss of that data immediately to that business. Um, so that would be my kind of two P as to what we've seen a lot of. Yes, there's a lot of other attacks. Last week we had um, one system that we have our security operations centre monitor in Plymouth. Um, had an, over a million hits in an hour, it was an hour and a bit actually, with regards to logging in. 
So we rec recognized the was <laughs> quite a clear spike and then picked up that the data was being siphoned out of their networks. So there's still traditional style hacks happening, but quite often now delivered through social engineering mechanisms, phishing and emails, um, because the technology that prevents and protects your perimeter is a lot harder. It's not so easy to hack a firewall. It's a lot easier to hack a person. Happy with your answer there, Bob? Uh, yeah, blo blockchain is, is very interesting nowadays and we've noticed government quite often is refusing to use blockchains because they cannot hack another system or something, you know, why, why are they refusing to use blockchains in their systems? Um, the two things, if you really look at the use of blockchain, there is a major flaw. And that is blockchain says the more you use it, the slower it gets. So there are some issues behind it, but also it's very hard to control. It's anonymous, it's without institute, etc. So therefore very difficult to put standards <coughs> towards. Um, and there is work toward it, but it's also understanding which way, which way forward to use, and then how you actually pr provide the ID on the other end of that blockchain. So there is actually a national group that is being formed for your interest called the DPA um, Identity and Management Group, and they are specifically working on ways that that might integrate or how they might put the identification process to. So blockchain isn't the only challenge, it's the person on the other side as to who they are, why they're using it, and where the destination goes due to money laundering rules, things like that, which blockchain lends itself quite well against hiding those kind of things. Okay, I'm going to drag the theme of the panel kicking and screaming a bit back to something in the southwest focus. Um, so, just from your experience, panel, have we seen any uptake of things like cyber essentials, ISO 27001, etc.? If you look at things like the Cyber Security Breaches Survey nationally, then you certainly don't see uniform and uh, overly significant adoption across the UK. You see a proportion, small proportion of organisations saying they're in some cases even aware of these, some cases compliant. How does the South West feel in that respect? Particularly I suppose cyber essentials which is the, if you like, the, the very baseline um, level that uh, the government is now trying to encourage. It comes back to my point earlier, it depends on what the trigger is. Um, the, the GDPR, you know, that, that wonderful acronym, is it, pe people panicking about it, they're jumping up and down about it, well, actually some of it should be business as usual and just modifying that standard I alluded to earlier. The problem as well with GDPR is, is the media again, because actually when we come to look at the UK, we need to be more worried about the data protection bill, which is the UK equivalent mm -hmm. of the European GDPR and as Brexit's going through, we've got to look, look, look into that. And particularly depends on the type of business you are, because you've, always, you've got to worry about the privacy and the electronic communications regulation, which is coming in exactly the same time. But the media, GDPR, ooh, scary. So it depends on where you are on that spectrum. Plus, if you're part of the supply chain, previously it was just about getting you to that cyber essential standard. But actually when it comes to dealing with that company, understanding where they are in the journey, cyber essentials might not be the fit. It might be depends on where they are with how they handle information insurance, how they handle their bank card for transactions. It may be a mixture of all three. And it's about understanding where they sit within that journey. And I think particularly down here, we're seeing a lot more companies understanding that they've got to do it. But sometimes it's a scaremongering that's made them think they've got to do it. Rightly so, they've got to do something about it, but maybe ethically we'd probably like them to come to us because they want to do it, as opposed to being scared into doing it. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, so I have no view as to um, how much of an uptake there has been on cyber essentials, but uh, it definitely shows um, an intention that things need to change. And so, um, yes, uh, we have seen that um, the level of awareness uh, of companies um, has improved, and so they realize that um, they need to improve the cybersecurity stance. Um, at the same time, perhaps um, the 10 steps to cybersecurity or cyber essentials or uh, full 27,000 uh, compliance might not necessarily be achievable for small businesses. Um, but um, it is 
there are steps in the right direction. Um, so uh, the fact that we have cyber essentials suggests that the government definitely wants organizations to reach that standard and um, so what incentives they will be given to reach that um, uh, will be another question but I don't have a view. On I suppose one incentive on the cyber essentials is, well certainly from the government perspective, they won't do business with certain organisations or for certain contracts if they don't demonstrate cyber essentials and I suppose they're hoping that culture will build across the, the wider industry. I've said, sorry, so I just say I've certainly noticed it spread into market types. So certain market types will almost demand it within mm. the contractual compliance, military being one, yeah. um, but we've seen it through foundries and manufacturing processes where it's pushed down to say you should have cyber essentials. Um, but even within that process there's an opt-out mechanism to say or you do the following. Um, but also just to tag onto that question earlier on about cyber and information security, it's an interesting uh, prospect in cyber, uh, cyber essentials and the compliance needs that Peter alluded to, to go. It's really good for, um, let's say, your, your information technology systems, but it doesn't certify the fact that your server is sat in an open room and could be accessed by anybody in terms of physically. So it's about understanding the need for that stamp in the first place, um, where, what it's driven from, and um, if it applies to your particular market. And MOD, government, things like that are definitely pushing it down. Thank you. Yeah, hands over here, Shannon. Thanks so much. Um, I want to ask a question sorry, from a different perspective about security in the Southwest, and it broadens it to more of a society uh, and local government perspective uh, and also maybe calling on some of the knowledge of, of the panel as to whether or not we're what we know or if we're certain that as the southwest we're not making the uk more generally less cyber secure so in terms that we always focus on threats in russia and threats in ukraine what about our own domestic threat the uh, the propensity to to get tools cheaply and easily freely off off the internet um, and the, you know, the activities of people who can just have a go. You know, do we know much about that uh, within this region? Or is there much in terms of crime prevention taking place or partnerships with education and other organisations um, to, uh, to address it? any issue, should there be one? Thank you. So Michael, I reckon you've got something you could say on that one with, yeah. with your campaign. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we've um, actively been working in that area for about a year now. We ran a few pilots with various schools, colleges, etc., uh, from various backgrounds, from special needs through to mainstream. Um, a few just comments I can make that have been brought through uh, various channels from, from official and, and, and other areas. Uh, first thing to state, for example, those of you who remember the team, guys like LOLSEC that used to be around, um, they're from the Shetland Islands. Um, one of the people who was involved within Talk Talk was from Plymouth. The US Department of Defense top open bug bounty researcher is from Plymouth. We quite, um, we're starting to notice a trend whereby a lot of these very highly skilled um, youngsters, which if you know the NCA statistic is the average hacker is 17 at the moment. So we definitely have a, a society, a societal issue. And one of those being that you have this kind of super talent, you know, the way we look at it in our field anyway, because of being a passionate geek myself, and happy to say that, um, is uh, if you are in that age and your friends are playing football, your parents don't have a clue what coding is, never mind what secure coding or, or what hacking code looks like, your parents, your teachers, your peers, your carer, guardian, whatever it is, insert term, will not realize what you've done, what you have in front of you. So what we've picked up is they quite typically go in onto forums and they have some friends in the forums who pull them from a normal clear net forum to a dark net forum and that gets darker and deeper as they go through all the way to a, an exercise where we spoke to a hacker who is in Plymouth, we don't know where he is, um, police are aware of this hacking name, goes by the name of Satan. Um, he sent us pictures via a message board while we were talking and interacting with him. He's making about three, four thousand pound a day from his bedroom. Um, 16 to 17 years old, extorting people like you and I by taking loans out on our name, extending mortgages, owning IDs and all that sort of, I guess, activity. Um, and he sent us a picture which will always, is almost burnt into my mind where on the bed was a pile of money in the, in the shape of 666 with what appeared to be two firearms on either side of the, the money. 
and this is someone down here in Plymouth, there are 12 more officially been, I guess, recognised that are doing the same thing just in Plymouth. Thank you. Other panellists on this question? I need to be careful what I say because of my background. Because obviously I'm a bit privy to some more information that I can't really share today. However, um, one thing I particularly would say is it's the type of threat from push button, let's crack on, which some of the ones that have been caught are doing. It's the clever ones who aren't getting caught, who aren't being put on any thought of threat record or anything like that. They're the issue. Um, and yes, the police do know about them, but they don't know what to do with them. And I think that's a reality. So the police are trying to work with companies, but they're doing, they have the uh, four piece to run with. And the way the last piece is all the, about the pursuing element of it. They can't do anything with the prevention and try and stop it happening in the first place. There's a lot of very good UK driving um, threat intelligence. There's some very good, um, I'd say the word forum for security professionals where a lot of the information that is shared within that forum is not shared externally. Um, probably the reality is if we all knew what crime is happening on our doorstep, we wouldn't leave the house. And to, to the point, I, I could quite happily say there was a business I used to work for and I know there was a cyber criminal across the road. Nothing I can do about it. So it, it, unfortunately, the reality is there's a lot of cyber crime going on. There's a lot of people talking about it, but actually the conversion rate into arrests is much, much lower. So, businesses to actually... There you go. Who's Michaels? So, yeah, so, more we do to help businesses educate businesses, educate homeowners, educate parents, more we're going to make it really, really hard for those UK-based hackers, those who are getting unauthorised access to something. One of the classes I run, or I used to run with school kids was, if I pick up your mate's phone and I start fraping them, did you know that was a criminal offence? No, no, I'm just doing it for the, lull, the laughs or the lulls. The, the reality of that is, that's a crime, that's a Computer Misuse Act of 1990. So that gives you a big idea, actually we have some much bigger fish to fry in the UK. But the police don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about Russia and Korea, because that's bigger and more important news, that's more newsworthy. Mm. You know, let's just run with that PR event, like Sony. Um, you know, more and more evidence is coming out, that's saying that's more of a PR stunt than anything else. So I think reality is a lot is going on with the UK. I don't think I know there's a lot going on in the UK. We, you're just not privy to it. Thank you. There was another hand up over there. Yeah. Rebecca. Uh, do you think that people who are currently holding security positions that don't have a security background could inhibit the progression of security within the Southwest? Um. So, whether organizations are ready to deal with the threats and the people who are involved um, um, in cybersecurity, um, whether they are able to deal with them is, uh, of course, an interesting question. And we have seen um, a lot of people from, let's say, physics background, math background, uh, business background, uh, trying to fill the gap and um, so moving into security because there are so many or there is a need for cyber security skills um, so um, some jobs um, you don't necessarily um, so let's say entry level jobs perhaps you don't need to have a, a degree uh, or a specialism in cyber security um, but um, when you go into the CEOs and uh, the security officers, um, then you really need them to have a technical background and a cybersecurity background uh, to appreciate the risks. Um, so, yes, we need everybody, I think, needs to have a 
culture, security culture, uh, even the end users. But um, realistically, with uh, the type of jobs and the fact that um, there are not a lot of um, cybersecurity professionals to fill uh, the gap at the moment, um, we're going to see a lot more people having one or two certifications and moving into that area. Um, so, um, yeah, obviously, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. Um, uh, but uh, the more we do to bridge that gap, um, uh, the less significant the problem will be. Let's broaden the question just a little bit. So, I mean, what do we think the options are for building and finding cybersecurity skills within the region? Do we have an adequate pipeline? Um, I'm sure um, Mike will be able to say uh, what they do sort of from the school ages uh, and Pete as well from the school ages to university. Uh, obviously we have, um, uh, well f from my perspective, um, a cyber security professional um, could will mainly come from a computer science background but there could be other disciplines as well like psychology, um, and business perhaps in a way um, that uh, would be relevant uh, but um, having a technical background computer science background with the cyber security skills uh, at university level will be important um, so of course the more could be done to attract people um, and to educate people even from secondary education. More, we're doing more to add computer science to uh, secondary education as well, which again will help um, <coughs> sort of guide students and um, um, give them the right skills. Um, but um, yes, I think more could be done um, to get people as early as possible. And as Mike suggested, the average age of a hacker is 17, uh, so a lot more needs to be done a lot earlier on perhaps. Okay. Mike, Peter? I think we have, as a UK PLC, um, made the right steps. The program referred to earlier on, the DCMS program, which includes SANS, FutureLearn, BT, people like that. £20 million that's going to be funded into, although there's no real clear path for that yet as such, but funded into cyber. you got the um, cyber champions, the cyber first, the cyber responders. There's a whole series of other programs which are free and accessible to schools and education, which are starting to push, I guess, the skill pipeline. Um, but looking at it from a skill pipeline also, that perspective is looking at how you know, maybe going to the root or part of what you sort of expanded upon, um, Stephen was saying, that you know, how, do you, how do you make or how do you have a pipeline? And I think it really is to identifying the people from that young age that have that interest, to identifying those university students, those college students that have that interest, because quite often I've got a, a, a real um, use case here. Um, a couple of months ago, this is live um, to have a look at now, so I can disclose. Um, as a business, we did a security um, research piece, and we owned Skype, the Skype that you guys use day in, day out. We had full, full ownership of it. Um, and that was by a collaborative nature of us working with someone who was 16 years old. So together this was put into the Microsoft site so you can see it and we got the bit of credit as such for it. But it's looking to that nature to say the homegrown talent is very much there. Even if you look outside, I've heard the same arguments sitting on a, a local board called the Employment Skills Board where we look at skills for all industries. Um, even in design, people saying there might not be talent. Well, go have a walk down any school's halls and have a look at the paintings that are hanging on the walls and you'll start to pick the talent up. And if you don't make the effort, which is what we're trying to do at the moment, to showcase the talent to the employers or the employers to the talent, then you will have a, a, a disparity and a mismatch and the talent will leave. So it's about in integration and the big thing that we're doing here in Plymouth is integrating those things like information security degrees, those candidates also have the ability to come and get experience with us which then equals to the fact that they come out with a degree and the experience and that is one of the key things. So if anything my one bit of advice and recommendation is build your homegrown talent, actually put a little bit of effort in to find those people because I can tell you now there are a lot of them and a lot of talented people in all various age groups and descriptions. Going to a, 
an event up in London for cyber. It was called Women in Cyber Security, run by Deloitte. It's the first cyber event. Um, I didn't have to queue at the toilet, and there was a queue for the women, so it's a bit bizarre, but um, that's just the way it is. And uh, one of the big things there is that this pool of talent even comes from people who studied history. Because by studying history, you typically be a fairly good linguist, which means in turn, you've got the ability to translate what is technical to board level. So the cyber skills and the awareness of people, etc., that have been brought up is really to look at cyber as a whole, not a tech geek, not an operational expert, not a people expert or anything like that. It's got a multitude of roles, management requirement as well. So that um, kind of homegrown home, um, grown pool or talent is something that can quite quickly be achieved, providing that you put the effort in, and that's from experience. Peter, any quick answer? Uh, very, very quickly, um, one thing I would just definitely say is, <laughs> uh, one thing I would definitely say is, from my own experience, that people join the cybersecurity market not actually to be technical. Um, actually, Michael will appreciate this one for his, from his event, Dr. Jessica Barker, a fantastic person, does some great reports, and she deals with the human aspect of the, our information cybersecurity element of it all. Uh, I would recommend there's a website from infosecskills.com. There's a thing called Skills Profiler, and you can put in your skills, you can see where you're at, and it helps you design your pathway. And it shows you the type of courses you can go on, what soft skills you can get. So if you want to try and get an understanding, go, actually, I like that really cool, shiny job at the top. How do I get to that job? It helps you, and it has the ISP pathway on there, it has a BCS pathway on there. So it gives people something tangible to look at with their career, even if they don't have any cybersecurity qualifications. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, very, very quick question there, if you can. Uh, have we got the microphone, Shannon, please? We're running out of time on the panel. <laughs> um, every time you mention skills and the people need degrees, you keep referring to, you know, filling in the gaps in the security um, environment and the discipline and Peter spoke about education and educating parents and the society but then the, the two of you keep talking about skills, 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 get people to security. I wonder if you provide this education from the lower levels and people understand how to use social media, what social engineering is, will we have a gap in the end in the security field or will all be adequate enough to understand when an email comes through. So are we creating the problem by just educating the talented and the people interested in security rather than educating society. So I'm going to make this a briefer question that we can round off with. Will educating society at the broader level remove some of the other problems that we see at the higher levels? I think so if the educational system changes slightly. Um, at the end of the day, they've got to understand there's more than just traditional maths and science and English. There's newer ways and I could say my, I'm teaching my six-year-old buying a diamond, for example. I think that uh, is a key because it's society that are getting attacked, not information security professionals. They're not necessarily not a target, but technically it's not a, a, a perceived target. So really it's about society, it's about people. If they are more aware, then technically we should lead to a, a more safe uh, online experience. Um, I I think it will definitely make things easier, um, but I don't think it will remove the need uh, for cyber security and in a way we have seen a change of threats um, and so more organized crime and perhaps it will remove the easy problems um, but not necessarily um, the more advanced threats. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, time has beaten us and we're now eating into the slot where we should be hearing about GDPR. So I will do very quick, thank you very much indeed to the panel. And thank you very much to you as the audience for your participation. Thank you.